This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce Chapter 14 Desil Holes Eamus Desil Holes Eamus Desil Holes Eamus Send us bright one, light one, whorehorn, quickening and womb fruit. Send us bright one, light one, whorehorn, quickening and womb fruit. Send us bright one, light one, whorehorn, quickening and womb fruit. Hoopsa boy a boy, hoopsa. Hoopsa boy a boy, hoopsa. Hoopsa boy a boy, hoopsa. Universally, that person's acumen is esteemed very little perceptive concerning whatsoever matters are being held as most profitably by mortals with sapience endowed to be studied. Who is ignorant of that which the most in doctrine erudite, and certainly by reason of that in them high minds ornament, deserving of veneration, constantly maintain, when by general consent they affirm that other circumstances being equal, by no exterior splendor is the prosperity of a nation more efficaciously asserted than by the measure of how far forward may have progressed the tribute of its solicitude. For that proliferant continuance which of evils the original, if it be absent, when fortunately present, constitutes the certain sign of omnipotent nature's incorrupted benefaction. For who is there who anything of some significance has apprehended, but is conscious that that exterior splendor may be the surface of a downward-tending, lutulent reality? Or, on the contrary, any one so is there unilluminated as not to perceive that as no nature's boon can contend against the bounty of increase, so it behoves every most just citizen to become the exhortator and admonisher of his semblables, and to tremble, lest what had in the past been by the nation excellently commenced might be in the future not with similar excellence accomplished. If an invericund habit shall have gradually traduced the honourable by ancestors transmitted customs to that thither of profundity, that that one was audacious excessively who would have the hardihood to rise affirming that no more odious offence can for any one be than to oblivious neglect to consign that evangel simultaneously command and promise, which on all mortals with prophecy of abundance or with diminutions menaced that exalted of reiteratedly procreating function ever irrevocably enjoined. It is not why, therefore, we shall wonder if, as the best historians relate, among the Celts, who nothing that was not in its nature admirable admired, the art of medicine shall have been highly honoured, not to speak of hostels, leper-yards, sweating-chambers, plague-graves, their greatest doctors, the O'Shields, the O'Hickies, the O'Lees, have sedulously set down the diverse methods by which the sick and the relapsed found again health, whether the malady had been the trembling withering or loose boyconnel flux. Certainly in every public work which in it anything of gravity contains preparation should be with importance commensurate, and therefore a plan was by them adopted, whether by having preconsidered, or as the maturation of experience it is difficult in being said, which the discrepant opinions of subsequent inquirers are not up to the present congrued to render manifest. Whereby maternity was so far from all accident possibility removed, that whatever care the patient in that all hardest of woman hour chiefly required, and not solely for the copiously opulent, but also for her who, not being sufficiently moneyed scarcely, and often not even scarcely could subsist valiantly, and for an inconsiderable emolument was provided. To her nothing already then and thenceforward was any way able to be molestful, for this chiefly felt all citizens except with proliferant mothers, prosperity at all not to can be, and as they had received eternity, gods, mortals, generation, to befit them with her beholding. When the case was so hoving itself, parturient in vehicle, thereward carrying desire, immense among all one another, was impelling on of her to be received into that domicile. O thing of prudent nation, not merely in being seen, but also even in being related worthy of being praised, that they her by anticipation went seeing mother, that she by them suddenly to be about to be cherished had been begun she felt. Before born bliss babe had, within womb one he worshipped, 
whatever in that one case done commodiously done was. A couch by midwives attended with wholesome food reposeful, cleanest swaddles as though forth bringing were now done, and by wise foresight set. But to this no less of what drugs there is need, and surgical implements which are pertaining to her case, not omitting aspect of all very distracting spectacles, in various latitudes by our terrestrial orb offered together with images, divine and human, the cogitation of which by sejunct females is to tumescence conducive, or eases issue in the high, sun-bright, well-built, fair home of mothers when, ostensibly far gone and reproductive, it is come by her thereto to lie in her term up. Some man that wayfaring was stood by house door at night's oncoming. Of Israel's folk was that man, that on earth wandering far had fared. Stark Ruth of man his errand that him lone led till that house. Of that house A. Horn is lord. Seventy beds keeps he there, teeming mothers are wont that they lie for to thole and bring forth bairns, hail, so God's angel to Mary quoth. Watchers tway their walk, white sisters in ward sleepless. Smarts they still, sickness soothing, in twelve moods thrice an hundred. Truest bed thanes they twain are, for horn holding wariest ward. In ward wary the watcher hearing come that man mild-hearted eft rising with swire you wimpled to him her gate wide undid. Lo, leaven leaping lightens in eye-blink Ireland's westward welkin. Full she drad that God, the reeker all mankind, would fordo with water for his evil sins. Christ's rood made she on breastbone, and him drew that he would rave in fair under her thatch. That man her will, wadding worthful, went in Horn's house. Loath to irk in Horn's hall, hat holding the seeker stood. On her stow he ear was living with dear wife and lovesome daughter that then over land and sea floor nine years had long outwandered. Once her in town hive meeting he to her bow had not doffed. Her to forgive now he craved with good ground of her allowed that that of him swift seen face, hers so young then had looked. Light swift her eyes kindled, bloom of blushes his word winning. As her eyes then ungot his weeds swart, therefore sorrow she feared. Glad after she was that ere a dread was. Her he asked if O'Hare doctor tidings sent from far coast, and she, with grameful sigh, him answered that O'Hare doctor in heaven was. Sad was the man that word to hear that him so heavied in bowels ruthful. All she there told him, ruing death for friends so young, Algate sore unwilling God's right wiseness to withsay. She said that he had a fair sweet death, though God his goodness with mass priest to be shriven, holy ounsel and sick men's oil to his limbs. The man then right earnest asked the nun of which death the dead man was died, and the nun answered him and said that he was died in Mona Island, through belly crab three year agone, come childermas, and she prayed to God the all-ruthful to have his dear soul in his undeathliness. He heard her sad words, in held hat sad staring. So stood they there both a while in one hope sorrowing one with other. Therefore, every man, look to that last end that is thy death, and the dust that gripeth on every man that is born of woman, for as he came naked forth from his mother's womb, so naked shall he wend him at the last for to go as he came. The man that was come into the house then spoke to the nursing woman, and he asked her how it fared with the woman that lay there in childbed. The nursing woman answered him, and said that woman was in throes now full three days, and that it would be a hard birth enough to bear, but that now in a little it would be. She said thereto that she had seen many births of women, but never was none so hard as was that woman's birth. Then she set it all forth to him, for because she knew the man that time was had lived nigh that house. The man hearkened to her words for which he felt with wonder woman's woe in the travail that they have of motherhood, and he wondered to look on her face that was a fair face for any man to see, but yet was she left after long years a handmaid. Nine twelve blood flows chiding her childless. And whilst they spake, the door of the castle was opened, and there nighed them a mickle noise as of many that sat there at meat. And there came against the place as they stood a young learning knight yclept Dixon, 
and the traveller Leopold was couth to him, sithen it had happed that they had had ado with each other in the house of Misericord, where this learning knight lay by cause, the traveller Leopold came there to be healed, for he was sore wounded in his breast by a spear wherewith a horrible and dreadful dragon was smitten him, for which he did do make a salve of volatile salt and chrism as much as he might suffice. And he said now that he should go into that castle for to make merry with them that were there. And the traveller Leopold said that he should go other whither, for he was a man of cottles and a subtle. Also the lady was of his avis, and reprieved the learning knight, though she trowed well that the traveller had said thing that was false for his subtlety. But the learning knight would not hear say nay, nor do her mandament nay have him in aught contrarious to his list, and he said how it was a marvellous castle. And the traveller Leopold went into the castle for to rest him for a space, being sore of limb after many marches environing in diverse lands, and sometimes venering. And in the castle was set a board that was of birchwood of Finlandy, and it was upheld by four dwarfmen of that country, but they durst not move more for enchantment. And on this board were frightful swords and knives that are made in a great cavern by swinking demons out of white flames that they fixed then in the horns of buffaloes and stags that there abound marvellously. And there were vessels that are wrought by magic of mayhound out of season, and the air by a warlock with his breath, that he blazes into them like to bubbles. And full fair cheer and rich was on the board that no wight could devise a fuller nay richer. And there was a vat of silver that was moved by craft to open in the which lay strange fishes withouten heads, though misbelieving men nigh that this be a possible thing without they see nathless they are so. And these fishes lie in an oily water brought there from Portugal land, because of the fatness that therein is like to the juices of the olive cress. And also it was a marvel to see in that castle how by magic they make a compost out of fecund wheat kidneys, out of chaldee, that by aid of certain angry spirits that they do into it swells up wondrously like to a vast mountain. And they teach the serpents there to entwine themselves up on long sticks out of the ground, and of the scales of these serpents they brew out a brewage like to mead. And the learning knight let pour for child Leopold a draught, and help thereto all the while all that they were there drank every each. And child Leopold did up his beaver for to pleasure him, and took apparently somewhat in amenity, for he never drank no manner of mead which he then put by, and anon full privily he voided the more part in his neighbour glass, and his neighbour nist of this while. And he sat down in that castle with them for to rest him there a while. Thanked be Almighty God. This, meanwhile, this good sister stood by the door, and begged them at the reverence of Jesu our author liege lord to leave their wassailing, for there was above one quick with child, a gentle dame whose time hide fast. Sir Leopold heard on the up-floor cry on high, and he wondered what cry that it was whether of child or woman, and I marvel, said he, that it be not come or now. Meseems it dureth over long. And he was ware, and saw Franklin that hight Lenahan on that side, the table that was older than any of the tother, and for that they both were knights virtuous in the one emprise, and eke by cause that he was elder, he spoke to him full gently. But, said he, or it be long, too, she will bring forth by God his bounty, and have joy of her childing, for she hath waited marvellous long. And the Franklin that had drunk, and said, expecting each moment to be her next. Also he took the cup that stood to fore him, for him needed never none asking nor desiring of him to drink, and, Now drink, said he, fully delectably, and he quaffed as far as he might to their both's health, for he was a passing good man of his lustiness and Sir Leopold, that was the goodliest guest that ever sat in Scholar's Hall, and that was the meekest man, and the kindest that ever laid husbandly hand under hen, and that was the very truest knight of the world, one that ever did minion service to Lady Gentle, pledged him courtly in the cup, woman's woe with wonder pondering. Now let us speak of that fellowship that was there to the intent to be drunken, and they might. There was a sort of scholars along either side the board, that is to wit, Dixon eclept junior of St. Mary Merciables, with other his fellows Lynch and Madden, scholars of medicine, and the Franklin that ate Lenahan, and one from Alba Longa, one Crothers, and young Stephen that had mean of a frere that was at head of the board, and Costello that men clep in Punch Costello, all long of a mastery of him erewhile jested. And all of them, reserved young Stephen, he was the most drunken that demanded still of more mead. And beside the meek Sir Leopold, 
but on young Malachi they waited, for that he promised to have come, and such as intended to know goodness said how he had broke his avow. And Sir Leopold sat with them, for he bore fast friendship to Sir Simon, and to this his son, young Stephen, and for that his languor becalmed him there after longest wanderings, insomuch as they feasted him for that time in the honourablest manner. Ruth read him, love led on with will to wander, loath to leave. For they were right witty scholars, and he heard their arsoons each gen other as touching birth and righteousness, young Madden maintaining that put such case it were hard the wife to die, for so it had fallen out a matter of some year agone, with a woman of Eblana in Horn's house, that now was trespassed out of this world, and the self night next before her death all leeches and apothecaries had taken counsel of her case. And they said farther she should live, because in the beginning, they said, the woman should bring forth in pain, and wherefore they that were of this imagination affirmed how young Madden had said truth, for he had conscious to let her die. And not few and of these was young Lynch were in doubt, that the world was now right evil governed as it was never other howbeit the mean people believed it otherwise, but the law nor his judges did provide no remedy. A redress God grant. This was scant said, but all cried with one acclaim nay, by our virgin mother, the wife should live and the babe to die. In colour whereof they waxed hot upon that head what with argument, and what for their drinking, but the Franklin Lenehan was prompt each one to pour the mail, so that at the least way mirth might not lack. Then young Madden showed all the whole affair, and said how that she was dead, and how for holy religion's sake, by read of Palmer and Beadsman, and for a vow he had made to St. Ultan of Arbrocken, her goodman husband would not let her death, whereby they were all wondrous grieved. To whom young Stephen had these words following him. Murmur, sirs, is eke oft among the lay folk. Both babe and parent now glorify their maker, the one in limbo gloom, the other in purge fire. But gramercy, what of these god possible souls that we nightly impossibilize? Which is the sin against the Holy Ghost, very God, Lord and giver of life? For, sirs, he said, our lust is free. We are means to those small creatures within us, and nature has other ends than we. Then said Dixon, Jr., to punch Costello, wist he what ends. But he had overmuch drunken, and the best word he could have of him was that he would ever dishonest a woman whoso he were, or wife, or maid, or leman, if it so fortuned him, to be delivered of his spleen of lusty head. Whereat Crothers of Alba Longa sang young Malachi's praise, that beast the unicorn, how once in the millennium he cometh by his horn. The other all this while pricked forward with their jibes wherewith they did malice him, witnessing all and several by St. Futinus his engines, that he was able to do any manner of thing that lay in man to do. Thereat laughed they all right jocundly, only young Stephen and Sir Leopold, which never durst laugh too open by reason of a strange humour, which he would not bereg, and also for that he rude for her that bear whoso she might be, or wheresoever. Then spake young Stephen Orgulus of Mother Church, that would cast him out of her bosom, of law of canon, of Lilith, patron of abortions, of bigness wrought by wind of seeds of brightness, or by potency of vampires mouth to mouth, or, as Virgilus saith, by the influence of the Occident, or by the reek of moonflower, or and she lie with a woman which her man hath but lain with, effectu secuto, or peradventure in her bath, according to the opinions of Averroes and Moses Maimonides. He also said how, at the end of the second month, a human soul was infused, and how, in all our holy mother foldeth ever souls for God's greater glory, whereas that earthly mother, which was but a dam to bear beastly, should die by canon, for so saith he that holdeth the fisherman's seal, even that blessed Peter on which rock was holy church for all ages founded. All they bachelors then asked of Sir Leopold, would he like in case so jeopard her person as risk life to save life? A weariness of mind he would answer as fit it all, and, laying hand to jaw, he said dissembling, as his wont was, that as it was informed him, who had ever loved the art of physic as might a layman, and agreeing also with his experience of so seldom seen an accident, it was good for that mother church belike at one blow had birth and death pence, and in such sort deliberately he scaped their questions. That is truth, party, said Dixon, and, or I err, a pregnant word. Which hearing young Stephen was a marvellous glad man, and he averred that he who stealeth from the poor lendeth to the Lord, for he was of a wild manner when he was drunken, and that he was now in that taking it appeared eftsoons. 
But Sir Leopold was passing grave, maugre his word, by cause he still had pity of the terror-causing shrieking of shrill women in their labour. And as he was minded of his good lady Marian that hath borne him an only man-child, which on his eleventh day on life had died, and no man of art could save so dark his destiny. And she was wondrous stricken of heart for that e evil hap, and for his burial did him on a fair corselet of lamb's wool, the flower of the flock, lest he might perish utterly and lie akeeled, for it was then about the midst of the winter. And now Sir Leopold, that had of his body no man-child for an heir, looked upon him his friend's son, and was shut up in sorrow for his forepast happiness, and as sad as he was that him failed a son of such gentle courage, for all accounted him of real parts. So grieved he also in no less measure for young Stephen, for that he lived riotously with those wastrels, and murdered his goods with whores. About that present time young Stephen filled all cups that stood empty, so as there remained but little mo, if the prudenter had not shadowed their approach from him that still plied it very busily, who, praying for the intentions of the sovereign pontiff, he gave them for a pledge the vicar of Christ, which also, as he said, is vicar of Bray. Now drink we, quoth he, of this mazer, and quaff ye this mead, which is not indeed parcel of my body, but my soul's bodiment. Leave ye fraction of bread to them that live by bread alone. Be not afeard, neither for any want, for this will comfort more than the other will dismay. See ye here. And he showed them two glistering coins of the tribute, and goldsmith notes the worth of two pound nineteen shilling that he had, he said, for a song which he writ. They all admired to see the foresaid riches in such dearth of money as was here before. His words were then these as followeth. Know all men, he said, time's ruins build eternity's mansions. What means this? Desire's wind blasts the thorn-tree, but after it becomes from a bramble-bush to be a rose upon the root of time. Mark me now. In woman's womb word is made flesh, but in the spirit of the maker all flesh that passes becomes the word that shall not pass away. This is the post-creation. Omnis caro ad te veniet. No question but her name is Puisson, who have entried the dear course of our Eigenbeier, healer and herd, our mighty mother and mother most venerable, and Bernardus saith aptly that she hath an omnipotentium de pare supplicem, that is to wit, an almightiness of position, because she is the second Eve, and she won us, saith Augustine too, whereas that other, our grandam, which we are linked up with by successive anastomoses of naval cords, sold us all, seed, breed, and generation, for a penny pippin. But here is the matter now. Or she knew him, that second, I say, and was but creature of her creature, vergine madre filia di tuo filio. Or she knew him not, and then stands she in the one denial or ignorancy with Peter Piscator, who lives in the house that Jack built, and with Joseph the joiner, patron of the happy demise of all unhappy marriages. Parce que Emlio Taxil nous a dit que qu'il avait mis dans cette fichue position, c'était le sacre pigeon, ventre de Dieu. Entweder transubstantiality, o der consubstantiality, but in no case subsubstantiality. And all cried out upon it for a very scurvy word. A pregnancy without joy, he said, a birth without pangs, a body without blemish, a belly without bigness. Let the lewd with faith and fervor worship. With will will we withstand, with say. Hereupon Punch Costello danged with his fist upon the board, and would sing a body catch, Stabu Stabella, about a wench that was put in pot of a jolly swashbuckler in Almany, which he did straightways now attack. The first three months she was not well, Stabu, when here Nurse Quigley from the door angrily bid them, Hist, ye should shame you. Nor was it not meet as she remembered them being. Her mind was to have all orderly against Lord Andrew came, for because she was jealous that no gasteful turmoil might shorten the honour of her guard. It was an ancient and a sad matron of a sedate look and Christian walking, in habit done beseeming her megrims and wrinkled visage, nor did her hortative want of it effect, for incontinently Punch Costello was of them all embraided, and they reclaimed the churl with civil rudeness some, and shaked him with menace of blandishments others, while they all chode with him, a murrain sees the dolt, what a devil he would be at thou chuff, thou puny, thou got in peace straw, thou losel, thou chitterling, thou spawn of a rebel, thou dyke dropped, thou abortion thou, to shut up his drunken drool out of that like a curse of God ape. The good Sir Leopold that had for his cognizance the flower of quiet, marjorie and gentle, advising also the time's occasion as most sacred and most worthy to be most sacred. 
in Horn's house rest should reign. To be short, this passage was scarce by when Master Dixon of Marion Eccles, goodly grinning, asked young Stephen what was the reason why he had not sided to take friar's vows, and he answered him obedience in the womb, chastity in the tomb, but involuntary poverty all his days. Master Lenehan at this made return that he had heard of those nefarious deeds and how, as he heard hereof counted, he had besmirched the lily virtue of a confiding female which was corruption of minors, and they all intershowed it too, waxing merry and toasting to his fathership. But he said very entirely it was clean, contrary to their suppose, for he was the eternal son and ever virgin. Thereat mirth grew in them the more, and they rehearsed to him his curious rite of wedlock for the disrobing and deflowering of spouses, as the priests use in Madagascar Island, she to be in guise of white and saffron, her groom in white and grain, with burning of nard and tapers on a bride-bed, while clerks sung curies and the anthem Ut novitor sexus omnes corporis mysterium, till she was there unmated. He gave them then a much admirable hymen minim by those delicate poets Master John Fletcher and Master Francis Beaumont, that is in their maid's tragedy that was writ for a like twining of lovers. To bed, to bed, was the burden of it, to be played with accompanyable consent upon the virginals. An exquisite dulcet epithem of the most mollificative suadency for juveniles amatory, whom the odiferous flambeaux of the paranymphs have escorted to the quadrupedal proscenium of connubial communication. Well met they were, said Master Dixon, joyed, but hark ye, young sir, better were they named Bow Mount and Lecher, for, by my troth, of such a mingling much might come. Young Stephen said, indeed, to his best remembrance they had but the one doxy between them, and she of the stews to make shift with, in delights amorous for life ran very high in those days, and the custom of the country approved with it. Greater love than this, he said, no man hath that a man lay down his wife for his friend. Go thou and do likewise. Thus, or words to that effect, saith Zarathustra, sometime regius professor of French letters to the University of Oxtail, nor breathed there ever that man to whom mankind was more beholden. Bring a stranger within thy tower, it will go hard, but thou wilt have the second best bed. Orate, fratris, pro memetipso. And all the people shall say, Amen. Remember, Aaron, thy generations and thy days of old, how little thou saidst little by me, and how by my word and broughtest in a stranger to my gates to commit fornication in my sight, and to wax fat and kick like Jeshurum. Therefore hast thou sinned against my light, and hast made me, thy lord, to be the slave of servants. Return, return, clan Milly, forget me not, O my Lysian. Why hast thou done this abomination before me, that thou didst spurn me for a merchant of jallops, and didst deny me to the Roman, and to the Indian of dark speech, with whom thy daughters did lie luxuriously? Look forth now, my people, upon the land of Behest, even from Horeb, and from Nebo, and from Pisgah, and from the horns of Hatton, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. But thou hast suckled me with a bitter milk, my moon and my sun thou hast quenched for ever, and thou hast left me alone for ever in the dark ways of my bitterness, and with a kiss of ashes hast thou kissed my mouth. This tenebrosity of the interior, he proceeded to say, hath not been illumined by the wit of the Septuagint, nor so as much mentioned for the Orient from on high, which break hell's gates visited a darkness that was foraneous. As to a faction minorates atrocities, as Tully said of his darling Stoics, and Hamlet his father showeth the prince no blister of combustion. The adiaphane in the noon of life is in Egypt's plague, which in the nights of prenativity and post-mortemity is their most proper ubi and quomodo. And as the ends and ultimates of all things accord in some mean and measure with their inceptions and originals, that same multiplicit concordance which leads forth growing from birth accomplishing by a retrogressive metamorphosis that minishing and ablation towards the final, which is agreeable unto nature, so is it with our subsolar being. The aged sisters draw us into life. We wail, batten, sport, clip, clasp, sunder, dwindle, die. Over us dead they bend. First, save from waters of old Nile, among bulrushes, a bed of fasciated wattles, at last the cavity of a mountain, an occulted sepulchre amid the conclamation of the hillcat and the ossifrage. And as no man knows the ubicity of his tumulus, nor to what processes we shall thereby be ushered, nor whether to Tophet or to Edenville in the like way is all hidden, when we would backward see from what region of remoteness the whatness of our whoness hath fetched his whenceness. Thereto Punch Costello roared out mainly Etienne Chanson, 
but he loudly bid them, lo, wisdom hath built herself a house, this vast majestic long-established vault, the crystal palace of the creator, all in apple pie order, a penny for him who finds the pea. Behold the mansion reared by Daddle Jack, see the malt stored in many a refluent sack, in the proud cirque of Jack John's bivouac. A black crack of noise in the street here, a lack bawled back. Loud on the left Thor thundered, in anger awful the hammer hurler. Came now the storm that hissed his heart, and Master Lynch bade him have a care to flout and wit wanton as the god self was angered for his hellprate and paganry. And he that had erst challenged to be so doughy waxed wane as they might all mark and shrank together, and his pitch that was before so hot uplift was now of a sudden quite plucked down and his heart shook within the cage of his breast as he tasted the rumour of that storm. Then did some mock and some jeer, and Punch Costello fell hard again to his yell, which Master Lanahan vowed he would do after, and he was indeed but a word and a blow on any the least colour. But the braggart boaster cried that an old nobodaddy was in his cups, it was much what indifferent, and he would not lag behind his lead. But this was only to die his desperation as cowed he crouched in Horn's Hall. He drank indeed at one draught to pluck up a heart of any grace, for it thundered long rumblingly over all the heavens, so that Master Madden, being godly certain whiles, knocked him on his ribs upon that crack of doom, and Master Bloom, at the braggart's side, spoke to him calming words to slumber his great fear, advertising how it was no other thing but a hubbub noise that he heard, the discharge of fluids from the thunderhead, look you, having taken place, and all of the order of a natural phenomenon. But was young Boasthard's fear vanquished by Calmer's words? No, for he had in his bosom a spike named bitterness, which could not by words be done away. And was he then neither calm like the one, nor godly like the other? He was neither as much as he would have liked to be either. But could he not have endeavoured to have found again, as in his youth, the bottle holiness that then he lived withal? Indeed, no, for Grace was not there to find that bottle. Heard he then in that clap the voice of the god bring forth? or, what Calmer said, a hubbub of phenomenon, heard? Why, he could not but hear, unless he had plugged him up the tube understanding, which he had not done. For through that tube he saw that he was in the land of phenomenon, where he must for a certain one day die, as he was like the rest too, a passing show. And would he not accept to die like the rest and pass away? By no means would he, though he must, nor would he make more shows according as men do with wives, which phenomenon has commanded them to do by the book law. Then wotted he not of that other land which is called Believe on Me, that is the land of promise which behoves to the king delightful, and shall be forever where there is no death and no birth, neither wiving nor mothering, at which all shall come as many as believe on it. Yes, Pius had told him of that land, and Chaste had pointed him to the way, but the reason was that in the way he fell in with a certain whore of an eye-pleasing exterior, whose name, she said, is Bird in the Hand, and she beguiled him wrongways from the true path by her flatteries that she said to him as, Ho, oh, you pretty man, turn aside hither and I will show you a brave place, and she lay at him so flatteringly that she had him in her grot, which is named Two in the Bush, or, by some learned, Carnal Concupiscence. This was it what all that company that sat there at commons in manse of mothers the most lusted after, and if they met with this horror bird in the hand, which was within all foul plagues, monsters, and a wicked devil, they would strain the last, but they would make at her and know her. For regarding believe on me, they said, it was not else but notion, and they could conceive no thought of it, for, first, two in the bush, whither she ticed them, was the very goodliest grot, and in it were four pillows, on which were four tickets, with these words printed on them, pick-a-back, and topsy-turvy, and shame-face, and cheek-by-jowl, and second, for that foul plague all pox, and the monsters they cared not for them, for preservative had given them a stout shield of oxen-gut, and third, that they might take no hurt at neither from offspring that was that wicked devil by virtue of this same shield, which was named Killchild. So were they all in their blind fancy, Mr. Cavill and Mr. Sometimes Godly, Mr. Ape Swillel, Mr. False Franklin, Mr. Dainty Dixon, Young Boastard, and Mr. Cautious Calmer. Wherein, O oh wretched company, were ye all deceived, for that was the voice of the God that was in a very grievous rage, that he would presently lift his arm up and spill their souls for their abuses, and their spillings done by them contrarywise to his word, which forth to bring Brennigly biddeth.
So, Thursday, 16th of June, Patrick Dinham lay in a clay of an apoplexy, and after hard drought, please God, rain. A bargeman coming in by water, a fifty mile or thereabout with turf, saying the seed won't sprout, fields athirst, very sad-coloured and stunk mightily. The quags and tofts, too. Hard to breathe, and all the young quicks clean consumed without sprinkle this long while back, as no man remembered to be without. The rosy buds all gone brown and spread out blobs, and on the hills naught but dry flag and faggots that we catch at first fire. All the world sang, for aught they knew, the big wind of last February a year that did havoc the land so pitifully a small thing beside this barrenness. But by and by, as said, this evening after sundown, the wind sitting in the west, biggish swollen clouds to be seen as the night increased, and the weather-wise pouring up at them and some sheet lightnings at first and after, past ten of the clock, one great stroke with a long thunder, and in a brace of shakes all scamper pell-mell within door for the smoking shower, the men making shelter for their straws with a clout or kerchief, women folks skipping off with kirtles catched up soon as the poor came. In Eli Place, Baggett Street, Duke's Lawn, thence through Marion Green up to Hollis Street, a swash of water flowing that was before bone dry, and not one chair or coach or fire could seen about, but no more crack after that first. Over against the right honourable Mr. Justice Fitzgibbon's door, that is to sit with Mr. Healy the lawyer upon the college lands, Mal Mulligan, a gentleman's gentleman, that had but come from Mr. Moore's, the writer's, that was a papish but is now, folks say, a good wheelamite, chanced against Alec Bannon in a cut bob, which are now in with dance cloaks of Kendall Green that was new got to town from Mullingar, with the stage where his cousin and Mal M.'s brother will stay a month, yet till St. Swithin, and asks, what in the earth he does there? He bound home, and he to St. Andrew Horns, being stayed for to crush a cup of wine, so he said, but would tell him of a skittish heifer, big of her age, and beef to the heel, and all this while poured with rain, and so both together on to Horns. There Leop Bloom, of Crawford's journal, sitting snug with a covey of wags, likely brangling fellows, Dixon, Jr., scholar of My Lady of Mercies, Vin Lynch, a Scots fellow, Will Madden, T. Lenahan, very sad about a racer, he fancied, and Stephen D. Leop Bloom, therefore, a languor he had, but was now better, be, be having dreamed to-night a strange fancy of his dame Mrs. Mull with red slippers on, in a pair of turkey trunks, which is thought by those in Ken to be for a change, and Mrs. Dress Purefoy there that got in through pleading her belly, and now on the stools, poor body, two days past her term. The midwives sore put to it and can't deliver. She queasy for a bowl of rice slop that is a shrewd dryer up of the insides, and her breath very heavy, more than good, and should be a bully boy from the knocks, they say, but God give her soon issue. Tis her ninth chick to live, I hear, and Lady Day bit off her last chick's nails that was then a twelve-month, and with other three all breastfed that died written out in a fair hand in the king's Bible. Her hub fifty-odd and a Methodist, but takes the sacrament, and is to be seen any fair Sabbath with a pair of his boys off Bullock Harbor, dappling on the sound with a heavy-braked reel, or in a punt he has for trailing for flounder and pollock, and catches a fine bag, I hear. In sum, an infinite great fall of rain, and all refreshed, and will much increase the harvest, yet those in Ken say, after wind and water, fire shall come for a prognostication of Malachi's almanac and I hear that Mr. Russell has done a prophetical charm of the same gist out of the Hindustanish for his farmer's gazette. To have three things in all, but this a mere fetch without bottom of reason for old cronies and barons yet, sometime they are found in the right guest with their queerities, no telling how. With this came up Lenahan to the feet of the table, to say how the letter was in that night's gazette, and he made a show to find it about him, for he swore with an oath that he had been at pains about it. But on Stephen's persuasion he gave over the search, and was bidden to sit near by which he did mighty brisk. He was a kind of sport gentleman that went for a merry andrew or honest pickle, and what belonged of women, horse flesh, or hot scandal he had it pat. To tell the truth he was mean in fortunes, and for the most part hankered about the coffee-houses and low taverns with crimps, ostlers, bookies, hallsmen, runners, flat-caps, waistcoatiers, ladies of the bagno, and other rogues of the game, or with a chanceable catch-pole or a tip-staff, often at nights till broad day, of whom he picked up between his sack possets much loose gossip. He took his ordinarily at a boiling cook's, and if he had but gotten him into a mess of broken victuals or a platter of tripes with a bare tester in his purse, 
he could always bring himself off with his tongue, some randy quip he had from a punk or what not that every mother's son of them would burst their sides. The other, Costello, that is, hearing this talk, asked, was it poetry or a tale? Faith, no, he says, Frank, that was his name, tis all about carry cows that are about to be butchered along of the plague. But they can go hang, says he, with a wink, for me with their bully beef, a pox on it. There's as good fish in this tin as ever came out of it, and very friendly he offered to take of some salty sprats that stood by, which he had eyed wisely in the meantime, and found the place which was indeed the chief design of his embassy, as he was sharp-set. Marte aux vaches, says Frank, then in the French language, that had been indentured to a brandy-shipper that has a wine-lodge in Bordeaux, and he spoke French like a gentleman, too. From a child this Frank had been a do-not, that his father, a headborough, who could ill keep him to school to learn his letters and the use of the globes, matriculated at the university to study the mechanics, but he took the bit between his teeth like a raw colt, and was more familiar with the justiciary and the parish beetle than with his volumes. One time he would be a play-actor, then a sutler or a welsher, then naught would keep him from the bear-pit and the cocking mane, then he was for the ocean sea, or to hoof it on the roads with the Romany folk, kidnapping a squire's heir by favour of moonlight, or fecking maid's linen, or choking chicken behind a hedge. He had been off as many times as a cat has lives, and back again with naked pockets as many more, to his father the headborough who shed a pint of tears as often as he saw him. What, says Mr. Leopold, with his hands across, that was earnest to know the drift of it, will they slaughter all? I protest I saw them but this day morning going to the Liverpool boats, says he. I can scarce believe tis so bad, says he. And he had experience of the like, brood beasts and of springers, greasy hoggets and weather wool, having been some years before actuary for Mr. Joseph Cuff, a worthy salesmaster that drove his trade for livestock and meadow auctions hard by Mr. Gavin Lowe's yard in Prussia Street. I question with you there, says he. More like tis the hoose or the timber tongue. Mr. Stephen, a little moved, but very handsomely told him no such matter, and that he had dispatches from the Emperor's chief tail-tickler, thanking him for the hospitality, that was sending over Dr. Rinderpest, the best-quoted cow-catcher in all Muscovy, with a bolus or two of physic to take the bull by the horns. "'Come, come,' says Mr. Vincent, plain dealing. "'He'll find himself on the horns of a dilemma if he meddles with a bull that's Irish,' says he. "'Irish by name and Irish by nature,' says Mr. Stephen." and he sent the ale purling about, an Irish bull in an English china shop. I conceive you, says Mr. Dixon. It is that same bull that was sent to our island by Farmer Nicholas, the bravest cattle breeder of them all, with an emerald ring in his nose. True for you, says Mr. Vincent, across the table, and a bull's eye into the bargain, says he, and a plumper and portlier bull, says he, never shit on a shamrock. He had horns galore, a coat of cloth of gold, and a sweet smoky breath coming out of his nostrils, so that the women of our island, leaving dough-balls and rolling-pins, followed after him, hanging his bulliness in daisy-chains. "'What for that?' says Mr. Dixon, but before he came over, Farmer Nicholas, that was a eunuch, had him properly gelded by a college of doctors, who were no better off than himself. "'So be off now,' says he, "'and do all my cousin German, the Lord Harry tells you, and take a farmer's blessing,' and with that he slapped his posteriors very soundly. "'But the slap and the blessing stood him friend,' says Mr. Vincent, for to make up he taught him a trick worth two of the other, so that the maid, wife, abbess, and widow to this day affirm that they would rather any time of the month whisper in his ear in the dark of a cow-house, or get a lick on the nape from his long holy tongue, than lie with the finest strapping young ravisher in the four fields of all Ireland. Another then put in his word. And they dressed him, says he, in a point shift and petticoat, with a tippet and girdle, and ruffles on his wrists, and clipped his forelock and rubbed him all over with a spermacetic oil, and built stables for him at every turn of the road, with a gold manger in each, full of the best hay in the market, so that he could doss and dung to his heart's content. By this time the father of the faithful, for so they called him, was grown so heavy that he could scarce walk to pasture, to remedy which our cousining dames and damsels brought him his fodder from their apron laps, and as soon as his belly was full he would rear up on his hind quarters to show their ladyships a mystery, and roar and bellow out of him in bull's language, and they all after him. Ay, says another, and so pampered was he that he would suffer not to grow in all the land but green grass for himself, for that was the only colour to his mind. And there was a board put up on a hillock in the middle of the island with a printed notice saying, By the Lord Harry, green is the grass that grows on the ground. And, says Mr. Dixon, if he ever got scent of a cattle raider in Roscommon, or in the wilds of Conmara, 
or a husbandsman in Sligo that was sowing as much as a handful of mustard or a bag of rapeseed out, he'd run a mock over half the countryside, rooting up with his horns whatever was planted and all by Lord Harry's orders. There had been bad blood between them at first, says Mr. Vincent, and the Lord Harry called Farmer Nicholas all the old nicks in the world, and an old whoremaster that kept seven trolls in his house, and I'll meddle in his manners, says he. I'll make that animal smell hell, says he, with the help of that good pizzle my father left me. But one evening, says Mr. Dixon, when the Lord Harry was cleaning his royal pelt to go to dinner after winning a boat race, he had spade oars for himself, but the first rule of the course was that the others were to row with pitchforks. He discovered in himself a wonderful likeness to a bull, and on picking up a black-thumbed chapbook that he kept in the pantry, he found, sure enough, that he was a left-handed descendant of the famous champion bull of the Romans, Boss Bovum, which is good bog Latin for boss of the show. After that, says Mr. Vincent, the Lord Harry put his head into a cow's drinking trough in the presence of all his courtiers, and, pulling it out again, told them all his new name. Then, with the water running off him, he got into an old smock and skirt that had belonged to his grandmother, and bought a grammar of the bull's language to study, but he could never learn a word of it except the first personal pronoun which he copied out big and got off by heart, and if ever he went out for a walk he filled his pockets with chalk to write it upon what took his fancy, the side of a rock or a tea-house table or a bale of cotton or a cork float. In short, he and the bull of Ireland were soon as fast friends as an arse in a shirt. They were, says Mr. Stephen, and the end was that the men of the island, seeing no help was toward, as the ungreat women were all of one mind, made a wary raft, loaded themselves and their bundles of chattels on shipboard, set all masts erect, manned the yards, sprang their luff, heaved to, spread three sheets in the wind, put her head between wind and water, weighed anchor, corded her helm, ran up the Jolly Roger, gave three times three, let the bullgine run, pushed off in their bumboat, and put to sea to recover the main of America. Which was the occasion, says Mr. Vincent, of the composing by a boson of that rollicking chanty. Peter Pope's but a piss -a -bed. A man's a man, for all that. Our worthy acquaintance, Mr. Malachi Mulligan, now appeared in the doorway as the students were finishing their apologue, accompanied with a friend whom he had just encountered, a young gentleman, his name Alec Bannon, who had late come to town, it being his intention to buy a colour or a cornetcy in the fencibles, and list for the wars. Mr. Mulligan was civil enough to express some relish of it all the more as it jumped with a project of his own for the cure of the very evil that had been touched on where he handed round to the company a set of pasteboard cards which he had had printed that day at Mr. Quinnell's, bearing a legend printed in fair italics. Mr. Malachi Mulligan, Fertilizer and Incubator, Lambay Island. His project, as he went on to expound, was to withdraw from the round of idle pleasures such as formed the chief business of Sir Fopling Poppinjay and Sir Milksop Quidnunc in town, and to devote himself to the noblest task for which our bodily organism has been framed. "'Well, let us hear of it, good my friend,' said Mr. Dixon. "'I make no doubt it smacks of wenching. "'Come, be seated, both.' "'Tis as cheap sitting as standing.' Mr. Mulligan accepted of the invitation, and, expatiating upon his design, told his hearers that he had been led into this thought by a consideration of the causes of sterility, both the inhibitory and the prohibitory, whether the inhibition in its turn were due to conjugal vexations or to a parsimony of the balance, as well as whether the prohibition proceeded from defects congenital or from proclivities acquired. It grieved him plaguily, he said, to see the nuptial couch defrauded of its dearest pleasures, and to reflect upon so many agreeable females with rich jointures, a prey to the vilest bonzes, who hide their flambeau under a bushel in an uncongenial cloister, or lose their womanly bloom in the embraces of some unaccountable muskin when they might multiply the inlets of happiness, sacrificing the inestimable jewel of their sex when a hundred pretty fellows were at hand to caress. This, he assured them, made his heart weep. To curb this inconvenient, which he concluded due to a suppression of a latent heat, having advised with certain counsellors of worth and inspected into the matter, he had resolved to purchase in fee simple forever the freehold of Lambay Island from its holder, Lord Talbot de Malahide, a Tory gentleman of note much in favour with our ascendancy party. He proposed to set up there a national fertilising farm to be named Omphalos, with an obelisk hewn and erected after the fashion of Egypt, and to offer his dutiful yeoman's services for the fecundation of any female of what grade of life soever who should there direct to him with the desire of fulfilling the functions of her natural. Money was no object, he said nor would he take a penny for his pains. 
the poorest kitchen wench no less than the opulent lady of fashion if so be their constructions and their tempers were warm persuaders for their positions, would find in him their man. For his nutriment he shewed how he would feed himself exclusively upon a diet of savoury tubercles and fish and conies there, the flesh of these latter prolific rodents being highly recommended for his purpose, both broiled and stewed with a blade of mace and a pot or two of capsicum chilies. After this homily, which he delivered with much warmth of asseveration, Mr. Mulligan in a trice put off from his hat a kerchief with which he had shielded it. They both, it seems, had been overtaken by the rain, and for all their mending their pace had taken water, as might be observed by Mr. Mulligan's small clothes of a hodden grey, which was now somewhat piebald. His project, meanwhile, was very favourably entertained by his auditors, and won hearty eulogies from all, though Mr. Dixon of Mary's accepted to it, asking with a finicking air did he purpose also to carry coals to Newcastle. Mr. Mulligan, however, made court to the scholarly by an apt quotation from the classics, which, as it dwelt upon his memory, seemed to him a sound and tasteful support of his contention. Talis actanta depravatio huius sceculi, o quirtes ut matris familiarum nostre lascivias, cuius libet semiviri libici titillationes testibus ponderosis atque excelsius erectionibus centurionem romanorum magnopere antecunit while for those of ruder wit he drove home his point by analogies of the animal kingdom more suitable to their stomach, the buck and doe of the forest glades, the farmyard drake and duck. Valuing himself not a little upon his elegance, being indeed a proper man of person, this talkative now applied himself to his dress with animadversions of some heat upon the sudden whimsy of the atmospherics, while the company lavished their encomiums upon the project he had advanced. The young gentleman, his friend, overjoyed as he was at a passage that had late befallen him, could not forbear to tell it his nearest neighbour. Mr. Mulligan, now perceiving the table, asked for whom were these loaves and fishes, and, seeing the stranger, he made him a civil bow, and said, Pray, sir, was you in need of any professional assistance we could give? Who, upon his offer, thanked him very heartily, though preserving his proper distance, and replied that he was come there about a lady now an inmate of Horn's house, that was in an interesting condition, poor body, from a woman's woe. And here he fetched a deep sigh, to know if her happiness had yet taken place. Mr. Dixon, to turn the table, took on to ask of Mr. Mulligan himself whether his incipient ventripotence, upon which he rallied him, betokened an ovoblastic gestation in the prostatic utricle or, or male womb, or was due, and with the noted physician, Mr. Austin Meldon, to a wolf in the stomach. For answer, Mr. Mulligan, in a gale of laughter at his smalls, smote himself bravely below the diaphragm, exclaiming with an admirable droll mimic of Mother Grogan, the most excellent creature of her sex, though tis a pity she's a trollop, there is a belly that never bore a bastard. This was so happy a conceit that it renewed the storm of mirth, and threw the whole room into the most violent agitations of delight. The spry rattle had run on in the same vein of mimicry, but for some larum in the antechamber. Here the listener, who was none other than the Scotch student, a little fume of a fellow, blond as tow, congratulated in the liveliest fashion with the young gentleman, and, interrupting the narrative at a salient point, having desired his vis-a-vis -vis with a polite beck to have the obligingness to place him a flagon of cordial waters at the same time by a questioning poise of the head, a whole century of polite breeding had not achieved so nice a gesture to which was united an equivalent but contrary balance of the bottle, asked the narrator, as plainly as was ever done in words, if he might treat him with a cup of it. Mais bien sûr, noble stranger, said he cheerily, et mille compliments, that you may, and very opportunely. There wanted nothing but this cup to crown my felicity. But, gracious heavens, was I left with but a crust in my wallet and a cupful of water from the well, my God, I would accept of them and find it in my heart to kneel down upon the ground and give thanks to the powers above for the happiness vouchsafed me by the giver of good things. With these words he approached the goblet to his lips, took a complacent draught of the cordial, slicked his hair, and, opening his bosom, out popped a locket that hung from a silk ribbon, that very picture which he had cherished ever since her hand had wrote therein. Ah, monsieur, he said, had you but beheld her as I did with these eyes at that affecting instant with her dainty tucker and her new coquette cap, a gift for her feast day, as she told me prettily, in such an artless disorder, of so melting a tenderness, upon my conscience, even you, monsieur, had been impelled by generous nature to deliver yourself wholly into the hands of such an enemy, or to quit the field forever. I declare I was never so touched in all my life. 
God, I thank thee, as the author of my days. Thrice happy will he be whom so amiable a creature will bless with her favours. A sigh of affection gave eloquence to these words, and, having replaced the locket in his bosom, he wiped his eye and sighed again. Beneficent disseminators of blessings to all thy creatures, how great and universal must be that sweetest of thy tyrannies, which can hold in thrall the free and the bond, the simple swain and the polished coxcomb, the lover in the heyday of reckless passion and the husband of maturer years. But indeed, sir, I wander from the point. How mingled and imperfect are all our sublunary joys! Maledicity! he exclaimed in anguish. Would to God that foresight had but remembered me to take my cloak along! I could weep to think of it. Then, though it had poured seven showers, we were neither of us a penny the worse. But beshrew me, he cried, clapping hand to his forehead, tomorrow will be a new day, and, thousand thunders, I know of a marchand de capote, Monsieur Points, for whom I can have for a livre as snug a cloak of the French fashion as ever kept a lady from wedding. Tut, tut, cries le fecondateur, tripping in. My friend Mr. Moore, that most accomplished traveller, I have just cracked a half-bottle avec lui in a circle of the best wits in town. It is my authority that in Cape Horn, ventre biche, they have a rain that will wet through any, even the stoutest cloak. A drenching of that violence, he tells me, sans blague, has sent more than one luckless fellow in good earnest post-haste to another world. Pooh! A livre! cries Monsieur Lynch. The clumsy things are dear at a sou. One umbrella, were it no bigger than a fairy mushroom, is worth ten such stopgaps. No woman of any wit would wear one. My dear Kitty told me today that she would dance in a deluge before ever she would starve in such an ark of salvation for, as she reminded me, blushing piquantly and whispering in my ear, though there was none to snap her words but giddy butterflies, Dame Nature, by the divine blessing, has implanted it in our hearts and has become a household word that il y a deux shows for which the innocence of our original garb, in other circumstances a breach of the proprieties, is the fittest, nay, the only garment. The first, said she, and here, my pretty philosopher, as I handed her to her tilbury to fix my attention, gently tipped with her tongue the outer chamber of my ear, the first is a bath. But at this point a bell tinkling in the hall cut short a discourse which promised so bravely for the enrichment of our store of knowledge. Amid the general vacant hilarity of the assembly a bell rang, and, while all were conjecturing what might be the cause, Miss Callan entered, and— having spoken a few words in a low tone to young Mr. Dixon, retired with a profound bow to the company. The presence even for a moment among a party of debauchees of a woman, endued with every quality of modesty, and not less severe than beautiful, restrained the humorous sallies even of the most licentious, but her departure was the signal for an outbreak of ribaldry. "'Strike me silly,' said Costello, a low fellow who was fuddled. "'A monstrous fine bit of cow flesh. I'll be sworn she has rendezvoused you. What, you dog?' Have you a way with them? Gad's bud, immensely so, said Mr. Lynch. The bedside manner it is that they use in the modern hospice. Dem, does not Dr. O'Glargle chuck the nuns there under the chin? As I looked to be saved, I had it from my kitty, who has been ward-maid there any time these seven months. Locks a mercy, doctor, cried the young blood in the primrose vest, feigning a womanish simper and with immodest squirmings of his body. How you do tease a body! Drat the man! Bless me, I'm all of a wibbly-wobbly! Why, you're as bad as dear little father can't kiss him, that you are. May this pot of four half choke me, cried Costello, if she ain't in the family way. I knows a lady what's got a white swelling, quick as I clap eyes on her. The young surgeon, however, rose and begged the company to excuse his retreat, as the nurse had just then informed him that he was needed in the ward. Merciful Providence had been pleased to put a period to the sufferings of the lady who was enciente, which she had borne with a laudable fortitude, and she had given birth to a bouncing boy. I want patience, said he, with those who, without wit to enliven or learning to instruct, revile an ennobling profession which, saving the reverence due to the deity, is the greatest power for happiness upon the earth. I am positive when I say that if need were I could produce a cloud of witnesses to the excellence of her noble exercitations, which, far from being a byword, should be a glorious incentive in the human breast. I cannot away with them. What? Malign such a one, the amiable Miss Callan, who is the luster of her own sex and the astonishment of others, and at an instant the most momentous that can befall a puny child of clay, perish the thought. I shudder to think of the future of a race where the seeds of such malice have been sown, and where no right reverence is rendered to mother and maid in House of Horn. 
Having delivered himself of this rebuke, he saluted those present on the by and repaired to the door. A murmur of approval arose from all and some were for ejecting the low soaker without more ado, a design which would have been effected nor would he have received more than his bare deserts had he not abridged his transgression by affirming with a horrid imprecation, for he swore a round hand, that he was as good a son of the true fold as ever drew breath. Stap my vital, said he, them was always the sentiments of honest Frank Costello, which I was bred up most particular to honour thy father and thy mother, that had the best hand to a roly-poly or a hasty pudding as you ever see, what I always looks back on with a loving heart. End of section 14A